1984 marks an exciting and pivotal year for Weekly Shonen Jump, and I know the majority of people watching this video are waiting for one manga in particular, but as usual, Jump serialized more than one manga per year, so we have a lot of other manga to get through before we touch on Dragon Ball. If you can't wait, or if you clicked on this video just for Dragon Ball specifically, I'll leave a timestamp down below so you can skip to that portion, but I recommend coming along for the ride as we look at all of what Shonen Jump had to offer in 1984. We begin our year with the 10 chapter 1 volume long Mr. Whitey by Ken Kitashiba and Tetsuya Sarawatari. The manga follows Shiro Asami, a young doctor and practitioner of Shorinji Kenpo, a pretty interesting martial art that you don't see brought up as much as a fighting style. Although here, Shiro combines his martial art prowess with his knowledge of the human body, presumably to deal devastating attacks. In the beginning, he defeats a group of robbers deciding to rob a bank, and then goes on to become a detective, using his unique set of skills to defeat criminals. Despite hyper-violent works becoming quite popular thanks to Fist of the North Star, it might not have appealed to younger readers due to its more elaborate and mature setup. And now, it's mostly known as the last Jump manga to not receive a volume release, likely making it difficult to get a hold of. It's got a very interesting legacy in that regard. Our second manga and the first big hit of 1984 would be Kumegure Orange Road by Izumi Matsumoto, lasting 156 chapters and 18 volumes. While it's talked about a lot less now in anime and manga communities as a whole, Kumegure Orange Road was impactful for helping define the shonen rom-com formula as well as introducing anime and manga to western audiences. The plot follows Kiyosuke Kasuga who has recently moved to a new home. Here his life begins to intertwine with two girls, Madoka who is cool and mature, and Hikaru who is more energetic and sweet. It all begins in a really atmospheric way. The manga has this really chill vibe initially, especially when Kyosuke and Madoka first meet at the stairs. The way the shadows of the leaves are depicted with this dappled light really adds to the manga for me. The art in general is pretty stunning, the characters are well designed, cute, and give off a more refined, poppy feel. It's also really well paced in panel 2, which makes it really easy to read, especially in the new Omnibus editions. These were actually from a Kickstarter back in 2016, so if you want them physically, be prepared for a hunt to actually find them, and then to pay an arm and a leg for them. As from my knowledge, there weren't many produced. Some basic research also leads me to believe that they were available digitally at 1.2, but I can't find out any modern way to read them officially right now, sadly. But if you look in the right places, the new translation with immaculate scans can be found. Back to the story, not only does Kyosuke have to deal with these two girls, who are initially depicted as tough, smoking delinquents, but he also has to hide his psychic powers. This aspect of the series is pretty understated from what I've read, and I kind of like it. You might assume it might be made more of a big deal out of, or lead to it being a more gag-centric manga, but surprisingly, I found Kumagure Orange Road pretty drama and character heavy. If you're a fan of shonen rom-coms, it might be worth reading. There is a big but here though, and spoilers for Kumagure Orange Road ahead. Although, I'd say it's also a warning for the series, as I don't really like it for a couple of reasons. Love triangles are a staple of shonen romance, we'll talk about them in the future with manga like Nisekoi and even the currently running Blue Box, but what Kimigure Orange Road does is a bit different. It introduces Madoka as a character Kyosuke immediately is enamored by, and then we get Hikaru, who falls in love with Kyosuke after seeing him shoot some hoops just like Mulder in that one X-Files episode. Your home style, cough up the rock! <laughs> Oh, no, no, I don't work like that. 
Through some misunderstandings, Kyosuke and Hikaru end up dating, though Kyosuke constantly blows her off in favour of Madoka. This began to infuriate me, and I know misunderstandings are pretty central to romance series like this, but what ends up happening is Hikaru is lied to, cheated on, and emotionally manipulated for three years effectively. I couldn't stomach it after a few volumes, so I just skipped to the final volume to check out how it ends, and to its credit, there's this really emotional breakdown Hikaru goes through when she realizes it's all been a lie. But what I despise about all this is that Kyosuke is trying to be in a kind of moral grey area here. He's in a tricky situation apparently. In reality, he's just been lying and ruining Hikaru's life for three entire years, only for her to ultimately forgive him and Madoka, who is her best friend by the way. The manga attempts to craft a nuanced relationship story which I was really excited to read at first. How would they handle these misunderstandings? Standings, and the answer I got was, they don't really. They repeat the same things over and over to maintain the status quo like a lot of rom-coms do, and while usually that leads to manga just being repetitive or boring, this one felt downright painful to read emotionally. I know this is a story, the characters aren't indicative of real life, but I imagine being in Hikaru's shoes and being lied to and gaslit and led on for three years, loving someone for that long and even changing for them, only to find out it was all a lie and your best friend was in on it the whole time. It's painful, and if the story was actually going for this and went all the way, it could be a really good tragic drama, but it hand waves it at the end and Kyosuke isn't really punished for it. It's a shame because it starts really good, it has the vibes, great artwork, and I like the characters initially, and especially Hikaru. She's fun, bubbly, and she's always trying her best. And even when she's royally screwed over, she finds it in herself to smile. I just wish it was better written than it was, because reading what I did took way too much of a toll on my sanity. Kimigure Orange Road would also get a really popular anime, a series of OVAs, and a film with an alternate ending, extending its popularity and influence all the way into the 90s. Regardless of my personal feelings to the series, it made a massive impact, influencing countless manga to come, and it also gave us a lot of really nice jump covers. Totemo Shonen Tankentai by Hiroshi Aro would last 8 chapters in 2 volumes. It was a gag manga focusing on an exploration team of children who attend Private Paranoia Academy, a school that features grounds for elementary to college students, as well as a massive unexplored chunk of territory that includes things such as jungles, ice flats, mountains, and deserts. The premise is pretty wacky and wild, but sounds like it's perfect for a gag manga with it focusing on the cast exploring these environments environments and coming across weird things like sentient grapes, whales that can swim through the school, and a bunch of quirky characters and references to pop culture at the time. While the series is very short, it wasn't axed as it was commissioned by Jump to fill in a space while Masakazu Katsura's wingman was on hiatus. Hiroshi Aro and fans must have enjoyed it as he would return to do more here and there in Monthly Jump, with it getting an additional volume basically. It also seemed to lack a lot of the etchy humour present in some of Arrow's other work, and overall, with its very cute art and fun premise, this is something I'd love to be able to read one day. Oh yeah, he fought under the name of Kid Minneapolis. Hey, I saw Kid Minneapolis fight once, in Cincinnati. No, you're thinking of Kid New York, he fought out of Philly. He was killed in the ring in Houston, by Tex Colorado, you know, the Arizona assassin. Yeah, from Dakota. I don't remember if it was north or south. North, South Dakota was his brother, from West Virginia. You sure know your boxing. Kenichi Kotani returns with yet another sports series that sadly flopped with only 19 chapters in two volumes, 1984's Kid. Not to be confused with the various other manga that pop up when you try to search for it, it has a very unfortunate basic name, which made doing research for it even more difficult. 
Kid follows Daisuke and Kaoru, a couple who have eloped due to Kaoru's father being part of the Yakuza. By chance, the two encounter Tatsuya, an amnesiac who only knows that he's a boxer. What follows is more of a human drama where a love triangle forms between the trio, with the Yakuza chasing Kaoru and the two boys fighting back in some way. Tatsuya's old girlfriend also returns and his eventual memories come back too, all at the same time this series is also being a boxing sports manga. It's pretty non-standard and unexpected from Katani, who usually seems to play it safe with his premises, but despite how hodgepodge some of its elements sound, this seems really interesting. A mix of drama, boxing, and romance, and another manga I wouldn't mind trying to read if it was ever translated. Killer Boy by Masatoshi Usune lasted 16 chapters in two volumes and is a motorcycle racing manga. While manga focusing on racing had good successes in the past with things like Circuit Wolf and Yoroshiku Mechadoc, the future wouldn't be so kind with Killer Boy and other racing manga in Jump, with it not finding much success. It's likely a mix of the work itself not appealing enough to its target audience, as well as the subject matter falling out of vogue with the kids at the time. Killer Boy was also pretty technical in its explanations apparently, and aside from that it was a fairly standard shonen sports manga, with its protagonist Kiratora racing his rivals and aiming to be the best motorcycle racer in Japan. It's not surprised it got cancelled with such a basic premise, where the magazine was undergoing so much change, with countless new manga with new ideas popping up at the time. Masumi Kurumada at this point is a jump legend penning one of the most influential manga of its age in Ring ni Kakero, and going on to create the decently received Fuma no Kojiro. He would find himself at the turning point of his career. It was now time for him to create the manga he'd always wanted to. Not the beloved Saint Seiya, that's a few years down the line. First Kurumada would create Otoko Zaka. At the time, this is what he thought his magnum opus would be, and an homage to Hiroshi Motomiya's classic Otoko Ipiki Yaki Daisho. It however was infamous axed at 30 chapters and 3 volumes, with its final page being fairly well known in manga circles here in Japan, being parodied similarly to 2004's Takaya, the very first Golden Future Cup winner. Otoko Zaka follows a student called Jingi, entering Shino Nome Junior High School. Undefeated at the age of 13, he challenges the school's boss to a fight, only to be defeated. We then follow Jingi as he gains strength, becoming an apprentice to a legendary fighter and learning the 108 rules of fighting. Using these techniques, he fights off other delinquents who he gradually befriends and adds to his growing army, in a similar vein to the previously mentioned Otoko Ipiki. These stakes get higher and higher as Jingi is embroiled in a conflict with the Junior World Connection, an organization comprised of the strongest fighters from all around the world, so it's up to him to unite Japan and take them on. Even with the usual Kuruma and a flair, it seemed that this concept and idea of a boys delinquent manga like this was a bit too old fashioned. It makes sense as Otoko Ipiki had long since ended and manga like this weren't really found in Jump much anymore. On the final spread, Kurumada declares that this is not the end and the work is unfinished. This is pretty bold as usually every manga that ends or gets cancelled will say so on its final page, but Kurumada made a massive exception here. The state of shonen manga at this time is interesting and Otokozaka stands at a crossroads. Kurumada himself helped pave the way for modern shonen battle manga with Ring the Kakuro, special moves over the top fights and manga like Fist of the North Star, which was growing immensely popular at the time, really honed in on the battle aspects and all of these special moves and things. Instead of following this path, Kurumada chose to look back at the past for his next series, not capitalizing on what was popular or how shonen manga in general was shifting. If you'd like a more in-depth look into Otokozaka and these ideas, I'll leave a link to an article from The Land of Obscusion, which covers a similar train of thought that really helped crystallize some of the thoughts I had on Otokozaka, and in general it's a really good read. I'll leave a a link to it down below. 30 years would pass by, but Otokozaka would eventually return, fulfilling what Kurumada had written in the original final volume. It would see a continuation in Weekly Playboy and then in Jump Plus, and go on for a total of 11 volumes, ending in 2023. You don't really get cancelled manga returning, there's only a handful of examples really, but this one, 30 years in the making, I think truly shows the tenacity of Masumi Kurumada, as well as the age-old shonen attitude to never give up. Get
And our bizarre friend, George Akiyama, appears for what I think is his final time in Jump with Kaijin Gonzui, lasting 11 chapters and one volume. They wanted him gone and they wanted him gone quickly, and I'm not surprised why based on what I could find about this series. Kaijin Gonzui begins with an African slave boy surviving a shipwreck in 1954, and much like Luffy, he drifts along in a barrel at sea, until not at all like Luffy, he lands on an island full of Japanese exiled criminals. Here, all manner of horrible things await. We get people impaled with harpoons, man-eating fish swarms, giant killer more eels, and also the main character Gonzui is depicted with green skin and looks like this. I really want to say I like the design, but this is all kinda yikes, especially in our modern age. The main heroine also has to breastfeed him at one point apparently, and has a dead decaying child on her back that just decomposes over time. This will not be the last time I bring up decomposition in this video, keep that in mind. If you haven't watched past videos, just note that George Akiyama is a very odd individual. His works outside of Jump are often immensely disturbed, and at one point I seem to remember one of his author comments mentioning him killing someone. The manga would take a sudden turn halfway through though, with all the adults leaving the kids to fend for themselves on the island. But it changes tone to be much more lighthearted, pushing ideas of Gonzui making friends with the rest of these kids, and including friendlier and more fantastical happenings, like there being a mermaid and even flying sharks. It's an undoubtedly crazy manga, and I'm not sure how this even managed to slip through in all honesty. It's not like George Akiyama ever had any huge hits for the magazine. What is notable though is this manga began the week after Dr. Slump ended and the week before Dragon Ball began, with its ending possibly being one of the first references to Dragon Ball as it said Dragon Ball would begin next week. Gakuen Johobu HIP by Jun Tomizawa lasted 29 chapters in 3 volumes and is a manga I've been interested in ever since I saw its covers. And yeah, they're kind of raunchy but also really colourful and there's something super appealing about Tomizawa's art style here. The title stands for High School Information Party, and in the same vein as something like Sket Dance, it follows a trio of students who help out with odd jobs around the school, leaning on comedy and etchy elements. In a way, it sounds a bit ahead of its time. This tracks with its general idea with some chapters sending the main cast to stop scammers in the school, like this one time a group tries to sell bottled tap water as health water, while other times the manga apparently tackles concepts like gender inequality and the disparity between older and newer generations. At least it seems to have a bit of a rebellious attitude that might still hold up today. Again, I just want to bring up the art which I really vibe with. It's in this perfect realm of being stylized but also simplified, but not lacking in polish or quality. There's this distinct feel to these 80s artists and how they draw their characters, in their eyes, hairstyles and clothing, which I really just dig. It's all so cute and poppy. Others seem to like the manga too, as while it did get axed, it ran for three volumes, which isn't bad at all. A similar length to series by veterans like Kurumada with Otokozaka, showing that HIP had some merit. It also even got a live action special in 1987, somewhat surprisingly. There's not much I can find about this, but it's cool that HIP isn't the most forgotten thing in the world. While Cool Shock BT was very charming and certainly unique, it also showed that Hirohiko Araki had a lot to improve on, and a year later he would come back bearing fruit with Bao the Visitor. Lasting only 17 chapters and 2 volumes, Bao begins in a train car where an evil organization called Duress has two children held captive, the 9 year old psychic girl Sumire or Violet, and the 17 year old Ikuro Hashizawa, who has been parasited with the bioweapon Bao. Immediately the art improvement in Bao is noticeable, the larger more cartoony faces and forms are still present, but he's gradually shifting closer to his early Jojo art style here. 
His style of storytelling is also much better than BT's too, with it opening immediately into an interesting setting where action begins to unfold. The majority of Bao follows the two escapees as they try to outrun duress and the variety of hitmen they send after them. It mixes in battle shonen with 80s action and sci-fi movies in a really cool way, and despite its quick cancellation, it works well as a short story. Some of its later fights are great. Araki goes full body horror mode in this one, with there being some especially gruesome deaths, as well as Bao itself being this body morphing creature akin to something like The Thing. To contrast with this, the relationship between Bao and Sumire is really sweet and touching. The slower moments and the people they meet along the way give it a nice road trip feel at times, and honestly, I don't really want to say much more because one, I think you should read this yourself as it's been fully translated. It even had a physical English release in the 90s, although that's long out of print. And two, this is a series I'd love to cover in depth someday on The Axe Files, another little series I do on this channel where I cover Axe Manga. Despite Bao being a shorter series though, much like Cool Shock BT, it has received some love over the years, with it getting a single OVA in 1989, and Ikiro slash Bao is a playable character in the fighting game Jojo All-Star Battle and its later re-release, showing it's still around and relevant in some forms. Bakudan would see Hiroshi Motomiya return to the pages of Jump yet again, lasting for 29 chapters and 3 volumes. Like some of his oldest works, he would return to a delinquent theme, with Bakudan now following the reckless Gunbei, the child heir of the Dojima Concern, a very large business conglomerate, but also the grandchild of a large Yakuza boss. Despite his heritage and the many people who would like to lead him onto different life paths, Gunbei chooses to go down his own reckless path, with accounts I've found saying he's a pretty absurd character who acts on his own whims, making him pretty hard to relate to. It's then he's taken to a temple to undergo training, where we get this pretty trippy and dark scene of him watching the High Priest decompose. I'm not sure why 1984 is so obsessed with decomposition, it's, it's really weird. Despite three years of training, Gunbei doesn't appear to change though, with him still acting crazy till the very end, and at one point he even robs a bank. And the finale sees him and all his allies just leave Japan by boat. It's been theorised that Monomiya may have just lost steam with this one, and he himself decided to end it, but perhaps it was also some kind of deconstruction or commentary on his past works, as Ginbei rebels against the typical character journey Motomiya usually depicts. In some ways, it also reminds me of Musashi, one of his earlier works, which also featured a very unsympathetic character who just goes around on a whim, doing whatever he pleases, so maybe Motomiya wanted another crack at this type of character. Either way, Bakudan went down as one of his more forgotten works. And finally, the golden age of Jump is in full swing, thanks to Akira Toriyama and the beginning of perhaps the most iconic manga of all time, Dragon Ball. It's hard to even begin with such a monumental series, but just months after Toriyama would finish Dr. Slump, a work that would be extremely popular and help influence gag manga greatly, he would come to do the same, but this time he would redefine what Battle Shonen would be for years to come. Things start pretty humbly though, introducing Goku, Bulma, Toriyama's penchant for drawing vehicles, and some breathtakingly fun paneling. Early Dragon Ball overall feels like it's still got pages from Dr. Slump, telling a lot of gags, both visual ones, slapstick, and potty humour. It's all there, but it also has a lot more action scenes, even if at first it's pretty silly, like when Goku kicks this fish in Chapter 1. Goku and Bulma meeting is really cute, especially since Goku is super naive and unfamiliar with most human customs. Their chemistry together is great. Toriyama sets up these characters to be lovable very fast and then throws us into the main plot, collecting the Dragon Balls. Each ball has 1-7 to seven stars, and if you collect all 7, you get a wish from the Dragon God Shenlong. Goku has 1 and Bulma already has 2, so we're off to a really speedy start. Chapter 1 also introduces the Hoi Poi capsules, which I always thought was a nice bit of world building, and it also characterises Bulma well. 
The setting is a fun mix of high tech with some odd fantasy elements and eastern martial arts. And then Bulma is characterized by being a snooty rich girl who's also a genius, but is also kind of just dumb. She's really endearing to me and all of this is conveyed in the span of a few pages. In chapter 1 we also get to see the Noi Bo and later on in the first few chapters the Fly Nimbus or the Kinto Un, artifacts relevant to Dragon Ball's loose Journey to the West framing and inspiration. A lot of the early series is just Goku and Bulma hanging out and telling jokes, Goku punching big creatures, and then early staple characters getting introduced like Master Roshi, Oolong, and Yamcha and Puwa. Those last two end up following Goku and Bulma as they hunt for the last couple of Dragon Balls, which lead to some fun slapstick jokes. Now I think it is a good time to say that aside from a couple of raunchy jokes, Dragon Ball is timeless in its humour and general attitude. It's just so much fun to read. The chapters are also so shorter than average, only clocking in at around 13 pages or so, so they're very digestible, especially when you factor in Toriyama's brisk pacing through his mastery of flow and paneling. Chapters just breeze by. These early chapters also feature the first ever Kamehameha by Master Roshi, which looks amazing. Goku follows this up with his first Kamehameha on a car, which I find really funny. And we also get a lot of bunny suit Bulma. The final part of this initial arc then involves Emperor Pilaf, who manages to nab all the balls Goku and Bulma have gathered up until now, and as he summons Shenlong, Oolong wishes for panties. It's so goofy and classic Toriyama. All this buildup doesn't go to waste though, as with a bunch of the cast all in one place, Goku is exposed to the moon, turning him into the great ape and terrorizing Pilaf and his goons. Through some quick thinking, Yamcha saves the day by cutting off Goku's tail. Him and Bulma then decide to go out together, and Goku flies off into the air on Kinto Un, ending the very first arc in Dragon Ball in an abrupt but satisfying way. And that covers the first 23 chapters of Dragon Ball. It introduces Goku, the world and some concepts like the Dragon Balls and special techniques like the Kamehameha. While the series did go on for 520 chapters and 52 volumes, I'm going to be doing something different with Dragon Ball and like all the other manga we've covered so far. Instead of just talking about it in one big lump, we'll be going through it pretty much arc by arc in these videos as they come up. So look forward to bits of Dragon Ball sprinkled throughout future history of jump videos. We're not quite done yet as well, as I need to give the series its dues. Dragon Ball probably has the most anime content out of any manga I've talked about so far, with it having a TV anime lasting hundreds of episodes, adding in a lot of original content not present in the manga. It also had spin-offs like GT, remasters of the original anime like Dragon Ball Z Kai, countless smaller spin-offs, tons of films, and even a currently in production new series called Dragon Ball Daima. Dragon Ball has a bunch of extra manga too, with some being made by other creators like Dragon Ball SD, and the most notable one which Toriyama supervised being Dragon Ball Super, which spawned its own whole host of extra stuff, which I have zero idea about in all honesty. There have also been countless video game adaptations ranging from the classic Budokai games to the modern ones like Kakarot, the upcoming Sparking Zero, and the popular fighting game by Axis, my beloved Dragon Ball Fighter Z. The impact this series had on a worldwide scale is just monumental. Toriyama was already on the map with Dr. Slump and had influenced countless artists to strive forward already. A substantial portion of manga though would be different without Toriyama's influence, especially with Dragon Ball. His paneling, designs, and characters would inspire countless mangaka to come, especially in Jump, which would gradually pivot to become the more battle shonen oriented magazine we know it for today. I'm sure there are countless videos and articles going over Toriyama's impact, especially after his tragic passing this year, but he really did change the world with his manga. 
It's weird writing and saying all of this, to be honest, because in the 1980s history video with Dr. Slump, he was still alive and now he's gone. And I'd never imagined that at the time, but that's just kind of how the passage of time works. Thankfully, we can look back, appreciate the past and how it's changed us to be who we are today. Really, that's what this series is all about. It's about looking back at the past and seeing how things have gradually changed and unfolded over time, to appreciate everything that has happened throughout Jump's history, to appreciate all the small manga and the steps the magazine has taken to become what it is today. And Toriyama and Dragon Ball is such a pivotal part of all of this. So despite all the sadness, ultimately I'm really happy I get to talk about him and Dragon Ball, not just today, but in the future episodes too. Thank you so much, Akira Toriyama. Rest in peace. And this brings us to the end of 1984, one of the most important years in Jump history, in large part due to one manga, but the surrounding smaller ones were interesting too. A reminder, you can read Kimigure Orange Road, Bao the Visitor, and of course Dragon Ball from this year. I'll leave a link in the description to the Viz website where you can read Dragon Ball officially. The first three chapters should be free too, and should you want to own it physically, I'm sure copies of it won't be too hard to find. We're currently at the beginning of Jump's Golden Age now, with classic manga after classic manga waiting for us to read on the horizon, and I'm so excited to talk about all of them. So please subscribe if you don't want to miss future history videos, and if this is your first one, I've got a playlist of videos covering Shonen Jump's entire history up until now, all the way from the beginning in 1968. The channel is also filled with other videos on manga and shonen jump topics if you're interested in that too. And I also have a discord where a bunch of people like to chat, do manga read-alongs and other fun stuff which I'll also link in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching, remember to be kind and take care.